different and where you are learning you are on the subway uh, it's very noisy and very crowded then you just use your mobile phone to learn something or you are in a quiet library they are also different so for the learners we can see they have many different scenarios so in this case but anyway it's very difficult the challenge here is that how you learn the learners because a lot of things we just talk in this slides probably we don't know at all sometimes we don't know where the person is okay you can only guess especially if they disable the location service you don't know whether he is in library or in on a train we don't know and uh, sometimes people don't want people to know uh, their age uh, whether they are young kids or whether they are old men or the uni student they don't want people to know which degree they already finished uh, whether they are doing phd or whether they are high school we don't know okay and also this kind of data is quite sparse and also we want to know what are the recent needs so because we want to have the latest data that will give us accurate uh, estimation what's going on with the student or learner so here are some uh, lists uh, it's just uh, basically from the earlier slide i don't want to talk too much about that i already explained that but here we can see the people we they have different pre-knowledge they have different learning styles uh, uh, and the people they have different memory ability but all these kind of things it's sometimes it's difficult to to capture and they have different learning speed and habits and also uh, dif uh, different degree of dis distraction some people even though they are in a very noisy environment they can still learn very well but some people even though they are in a very quiet place there's no distraction but they can always do daydreaming they will be distracted by themselves that's also possible and we also have some other features to consider what are the performance and what are the reliability robust scalability uh, all these kind of things is uh, all talked about system but uh, I, I i want to skip that uh, because uh, we will mainly today we talk about the computational intelligence part of how we use the algorithm to do that then we have external factors i also talk about that uh, what are the um, a degree of the uh, uh, distraction, uh, disruption in the environment, uh, like where the learner is. In this case, if you if you we can really connect all the data, we use ed educational data mining and learning analytics. So EDM and LA means educational data mining and learning uh, analytics. So this is we try to connect all the data uh, to understand how people learn. So in this case, actually, we got some data from UW. We have data analytics, uh, uh, so without uh, breaching any privacy. But as I said, we can monitor how students use Moodle, how students really uh, watch the video. Uh, I think now every day, I'm not sure about the KDU, but in UW, every day uh, when I finish a lecture, I even can know uh, how many students attend the class. Then uh, when the students come into the class, and which uh, particular part uh, because they come to the class they probably uh, need to open the lecture notes uh, the the teacher put online and after the class uh, when a particular student they watch the video uh, from where and uh, for how long they really engage with the video we can have all this kind of data so this is uh, some example of data we can get from the uh, the uh, Moodle system okay then we we want to build some other models so basically we already know the learners uh, and we can connect data but we also need to build up certain uh, data structure to describe them so here we use a conceptual uh, graph uh, but currently i think uh, a, a modern name for this is called knowledge graph uh, they they are not the same uh, but they are very similar but what we are doing is just we we got these uh, uh, independent data from what we described but all this data they have certain relationships just uh, for example for the learner we just uh, talk about that for the learner they have different uh, type they have uh, different uh, skills they have different uh, motivation they have different distraction so for even one single learner we can find many features and all these features between them they also have some connections so as i said we probably don't know everything about one single person but we may know partial knowledge then from this partial knowledge we can detect what this person may look like okay for each of these features they have some sub features 
Sometimes we know some feature, we don't know the main feature, but we can deduct. Or we know the main feature, we don't know the subcategory, but we can deduct. And later we will discuss, we will use similarity. It's like if we know some data about one learner, but we don't know some data about another learner, but we have certain ways to find out these two learners, they are similar. For example, they come from the same class. So they may probably share some similarity. Then we can use this graph to match that for the different part, we just share their, uh, their data. So that can help us to fill in the reasonable data. So this is, we say, this is like a semantic uh, relationship or this data entity. So we talk about learner, we also need to build the knowledge graph for the learning resources. As we said, uh, we uh, segment or fragment all the learning materials from 15 minutes to uh, 15 minutes, okay? or even shorter. But we should also notice that something we cannot really fragment them into the short part. Uh, for example, if you are doing the film studies, uh, you need to just watch one movie then that movie could be two hours. Then you don't want to segment them because only after you watch the whole two hour movie, you will learn something, just for example. So this is not a golden uh, rule that you should have, or in our system, you should have everything is uh, shorter than 15 minutes. But here we need to identify what are micro learning resources, what are not micro learning resources. So there are many different uh, features for this as well. What's the time length and the uh, difficulty of the knowledge, whether it's complete. So again, and also it, whether it requires uh, much attention, uh, what are the preferred learning style, what are the interaction. So a lot of things relate to this kind of learning material. So we can see for the learning is very complex. Uh, so it's not easy to be a teacher. We need to consider a lot of things, okay? But sometimes we probably don't pay attention to that. But in, to develop this system, we need to um, really have a closer look what this kind of micro learning resource will look like and what are the relationship. So this is another logic graph just described for what kind of learning uh, resources we have, uh, we, can, uh, we can do. So now this is, I just give you the background. What we want to do, the micro learning as a service is how we get the users engaged into the fragmented online learning. So this is where we can use algorithms. So one big challenge is in the beginning, we don't know, know, know the learner. So this is what like what happened with YouTube, what happened with Facebook. In the beginning, they just have thousands or millions of users. But now, like TikTok, uh, in the beginning, they don't have many users. They didn't have many users, but now they have billions of users. So when they have billion users, they don't worry about how to uh, derive the similarity between the persons or users. Uh, they can, but they have a lot of data. But in the beginning, like in our system, in the beginning with a new learner, or just like a new student come to the uni, we don't know anything about them. Only after one year or second or, or one semester, we we will learn uh, what's the grade, whether they failed some subjects or whether they get HD for uh, for many subjects. Uh, we will say, oh, this student maybe is studying hard or maybe smarter or something like that. We know better, but in the beginning we don't know. So this is the first ch uh, uh, challenge is that how computational intelligence or we say AI or certain algorithm can help us, because initially we don't have data. But what we will do is try to figure out that we can use whatever existing data, then we figure out what has similarity. We found that we don't know this student, but we found this student has the same background, have certain same features with some other students. Then we just deduce that for this student probably share the same features as what other students we, we have known. But anyway, this is adaptive process. Because in the beginning, of course, we don't have sufficient data. Then we can use this way. But when we learn this person more and more, we will adjust because we will find, initially we think for a teacher, when you face your new class in the first year, you think everybody is the same. But after one week, after two weeks, after two months, after two years, you will know in detail, every student is different, totally different. And they share some similarity features. 
but that's over time. We will learn that. So this is where we computation intelligence, they should be what adapted. They adapt, adjust to the environment to, to adjust themselves. So in the next, next slides, uh, you will see some mathematical stuff. Uh, I, will go uh, I will not go detail to that because I'm not supposed to, to uh, teach how we do the algorithm. But I will just quickly explain what are the parameters or things we need to consider. For example, first is the instance, instant time availability, availability. So here that means, here we can see this is one divided by time span. So this is just indicates for people when the time is goes going on, their attract a distractive distraction will grow, or they will be less engaged. So that's why when the, the, the time is longer, their confidence degree to have the time availability, that means how long they want to stay to learn this thing will become less or they more likely to get distracted, or they more likely go to do something else. So we want to make sure, as we said, we fragmented all these kind of materials into short period of time. But with the time in the beginning, we say everybody is 100% engaged, but over the time, their engagement will be smaller and smaller. And at the end of our design uh, length of the material, we suppose the students will walk away. Uh, it, it doesn't make any more sense that uh, the students will keep go on going. And we also uh, have some other parameters. Uh, here is about uh, the, the learning materials, they have some relationship. Or we have the students, they have preference of what they want to learn. So in this case, for example, one student, if they want to learn machine learning, they, they really want to learn that. But we know that before you can really understand machine learning, you need to have some pre-knowledge. For example, you need to know some mathematical stuff. You need to know some programming stuff. You need to know some data science stuff. If you don't know that, you can't probably learn machine learning very well. So the students, they have problems to learn something, but whether really they can learn that stuff, it depends on all these kind of uh, prior knowledge. And for every knowledge, knowledge uh, in our uh, whole society, uh, we have machine learning, we have C++, uh, we have AI, we have uh, visualization, uh, we have data database, uh, we have many things and networking. All of them, they use different knowledge points, they use different knowledge, we need to build up. Okay, but all these knowledge, they have dependencies. So we can also uh, define the distraction uh, this is, is about uh, the environment. Uh, we say if, if the person is in a noisy environment or is in a quiet environment, their distraction degree may be different. So initially we don't know, but if we can find any information, like uh, we can, if we can detect this person is on a, a very busy bus route, we will imagine that person will be in a very noisy environment. But if we notice that this person is in a very quiet place like a library, we think this person will be more uh, uh, engaged in the learning. So all these kind of things, we can add them together. So we don't need to worry about how to calculate. But what we want to do is that we consider all these parameters or factors together to find out what are the best match. Okay, what are the best match? Okay. So build, to build this kind of algorithms, uh, we first need to uh, create association relations. This is about what are the relationship between of the learning materials, because they are not independent. As we said, you, if you learn machine learning, you need to learn something else first. So we need to build this kind of association. So how strong the association is, uh, we depend on different uh, uh, knowledge points. So then we can use certain algorithms. So this is kind of algorithms, how to generate the recommendation based on what we discussed. So uh, as I said, I will not go to the detail on that, but I will, uh, and also we can calculate the suitability of these materials, uh, whether they really uh, is something the students really are happy to accept. This is the same as we, if we use Google search engine, if we search something, uh, of course, nowadays they are very accurate, uh, but when we search something, we uh, whether we click on the Google search engine result, we will give feedback to the Google algorithms. They will know really whether this is a good or suitable recommendation or the, the links sent to the user. 
then they can adjust the the uh, algorithm. The this same here, we are similar. We are all doing this kind of recommendation. So we need to have the fitness function to consider all these different factors together, and that will lead us to get the final result. So what we will do is that it's not that we will have one single hit uh, to recommend. Actually, we may have many n uh, hits. This is same as I said for the Google search engine. When you search something, it will give you a list of uh, what's on the top and uh, a lot of related information are there. Then you can judge which one is really you want to want to see. If you type in very specific, very long keywords, they will be more accurate, but sometimes they will also be more destructive. They have their ways to calculate. But for the learning, the same, we are not just give you one single micro resources, but also we will give you a lot. So the success of this uh, algorithm will depend on how many top uh, uh, learning uh, resources we can get and whether they really uh, meet the re uh, requirement for the user. So there are quite a few algorithms. I will uh, add this calculation about how to do the prediction. Uh, I put it here, it's just to give you some idea that actually behind the algorithm of community intelligence, we actually collect all the data, calculate the data, and using different algorithms to, to calculate them. So I put it in the bottom, uh, I think this is recorded. If you are really interested in the algorithm behind that, you are welcome to look at the, 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 uh, uh, the, the papers uh, we published in, in, uh, in this um, journals or conferences. But what I want to uh, share uh, here is that what are the results? So here we can see, as we said, we, we, we recommend the micro learning materials to uh, students. So here we can see we try a different grade, we try a different level of studies, uh, we use different algorithms uh, like genetic algorithm, simulated annealing, and uh, uh, evolutionary uh, computation, different algorithms. Because this is basically evolution algorithm problem. We have the data, we want to do the match make, uh, making. Uh, initially, we don't know what the best matchmaking, but based on what all the equations we showed earlier, uh, we want to uh, get the bet better fit. Then the algorithm try to guide the data to be converged to the best result. Okay, so this is the result uh, we can get. So here we can see the recall is increasing. The recall is, is about what exactly uh, we recommended is what the users are really want to see. So here we can see we have different algorithms. In the left side, uh, we have different color. So genetic algorithm is GA, uh, simulated allele is SA, uh, the taboo search and evolution program. We have four algorithms. We can see they have very similar trend. So the top end, that means if we want to get the top five correct, is actually the recall rate is very low. It's below 20%. Uh, but if we say we, we get like a top 20 to be uh, recommended to be within the, uh, the acceptable uh, range for the learner, we can reach about 40%. But actually the maximum uh, is about 40%. For the precision, we can see that uh, for the first uh, five, uh, it's quite uh, uh, accurate, uh, but it could, but it's only 50%. So that means in this case, we probably sometimes because of data uh, availability problem, we don't have all the data, we don't, not all the users, all the learners, we know everything about them. Actually, how accurate it is, it's not like computer vision. Uh, nowadays, like uh, in uh, on the video, you can identify one single person's face to know who exactly he is. Uh, that could be 90%. But here, to to uh, target the learning materials to recommend to learners, we can achieve 50%. And if you say more the top end, that will be decreasing. So this is a trend. So this is another, uh, 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 Sin is uh, showing that another study. Uh, so we can see uh, right side is uh, still same trend, but on the left side we can see with different algorithms they are quite messy. So th that means the different algorithm we use to do the recommendation 
they may get totally different result. So this is means that this is still quite a challenge. The last thing we want to see uh, is that uh, for different disciplines, the results uh, may also be different when we recommend the resources. So we tried IT subjects, business subjects, and social science subjects. So this is X, uh, uh, X the, the, the Y axis means average VD. That means the higher uh, the works. The higher, uh, that means they are more deviated to, uh, from the user's uh, need. So here we can see like businesses uh, in general is much better than IT and social science, but social science probably the worst. So we can see for different disciplines where we recommend the uh, learning materials. So these algorithms, the similar algorithms, probably they also yield a different result. Okay. So this is the first part I talk about the, the uh, education. Uh, we use the computational intelligence uh, in the education, how to recommend the fragmented knowledge or learning materials to learners or the students. So as I said, our second part for today is talking about knowledge as service. So this is about a proteomics. So what is a proteomics? So this is a study about a protein. So what are the protein? Everybody knows we eat protein, uh, but actually every living organisms, uh, plants and uh, animals or human, we all made up of proteins. That also means we have virus, bacteria, they are also proteins. If you read all the news about the uh, COVID-19 in the past few years, uh, we probably always uh, have all the different news about the virus in the past few, two years. So you may notice that we have vaccination. So when some a bit more technical article talk about vaccination, they also mention the vaccination is something try to change the protein in our human body. So that with this kind of protein will intact with the COVID-19 virus to protect our human body. And they will create a certain antibody to defend our human body. So all this kind of uh, antibody or antigen, they are all proteins. So the proteins comes with different shape and they have different feature. Uh, I think everybody knows the image about the COVID-19. It looks like a, a ball, then it has a lot of uh, spikes. Uh, it looks uh, very cute, but actually it's very poisonous. So we have many different kind of this kind of uh, virus, like our flu uh, in Australia. Now in a, we are in a winter. Uh, I think Malaysia is in summer. So winter we always have a lot of flu. So they actually quite similar to to the COVID. If we just look at a picture of the the virus, they probably similar. But why the COVID nineteen cause so much problem? Because uh, they are more dangerous. They have certain uh, protein part. They attack human body. Uh, I think initially probably attack animals, but we animals we never notice any animal has a problem. We but later now they become a problem for the whole human. So what are the protein are made? The protein are actually made of amino acid. I'm not sure uh, anybody know about that. And all the proteins actually are made of all the different amino acids, but they in different composition. What's the funny thing is that actually we just about have about 20 to 23 different amino acid. That means we can use the letters from A to Z. From A to Z, we have 26 letters. So we don't even use all the letters to identify amino acid. So here on the top, we can see A, B, C, D. So the, each letter actually represents each amino acid. Why it has seven groups? Because actually you can see all the amino acids. Actually, many of them, they can be grouped. Like group two, three, four, each of them, they have four different amino acids. These four amino acids, they are quite similar to each other. So we make them into the groups. So here we can understand no matter how complex our Earth is, our Earth animals or all these kind of living uh, Organization, organism we have, actually just seven groups of amino acids. 
But when these amino acids in the left bottom part, we have the colorful or three D, uh, some some balls, and we have some this kind of uh, like blood vessels. This is not blood vessel, but actually they there are some links between the amino acids. Actually, they are just chemical molecules. So in the left bottom side, we can see with all these amino acids, they form up in different shapes. Then they form up in different protein. So we have 2D and 3D protein here. Then all these proteins, they will different type of proteins. We probably have 16,000 different type of protein made up from amino acids. Then they will make up different living organisms. For the viruses, quite they are simple, but very simple combination of all these they become very dangerous or poisonous. So why is this become a computer or computational intelligence problem? Because we can see here, we can use letters, we can use numbers to identify the composition or components of the proteins. Then we can encode all the proteins as a, a encoded number. Even for the COVID-19, no matter how complex it is, we, as far as we know more about it, we can just use letters or numbers to describe that. But the problem is that we have so many different viruses, we have so many different bacteria, and each of them, they are in different format. They are formed by the 22, 23 different amino acids, but they are in different 3D structure. Okay. Uh, nowadays, we have a certain uh, microscopy to, to watch them. Uh, I will show some picture later. But in most cases, that's very expensive. And sometimes you take picture, we don't know what exactly it is. So what we know is that some virus, some bacteria, they will cause problem. Some are not. I think everybody know every day, uh, we will, when we eat something, we will actually eat a lot of virus and bacteria. So in our body, uh, in our instant, it said we have so many bacteria. We are also told some bacteria are even good to our health, and some people may take also is pro, it's called protein. Uh, so uh, for uh, pro antibiotics, uh, protein to help us to to help our uh, stomach and the instant. We have good bacteria, but what we are worried about, we have bad bacteria, we have bad virus, they cause big problem. No matter it's COVID-19 or, or monkeypox. But for the doctors, they only notice that somebody are coughing, somebody are going to toilet for many times. They notice that this person has a problem. And what they will do, they will try to isolate the virus from their blood, from their uh, nose, uh, from their uh, pools. We identify, oh, there's a virus here. But we will not take picture of what's in the virus. It's very expensive to take picture. But what we will know when we do this, we can have the protein sequencing. With the protein sequencing, we will get the data like this like the, what I show here. And when we connect all these different data, we have many different virus, we have many different bacteria, we have all their encoded number or letters. And we know that some of them causing problems, some are not causing problems. So here we say we can use computational intelligence to solve the problem because we can connect all the data with one protein will cause problem for another protein. Or we say the protein and protein, they have interaction. Whether the protein interaction, they are positive. Positive means they are having problem. So here with COVID-19, we say somebody are positive, somebody are negative. So basically we are using antigen to tell people that this person gets something from their nose. We, we know that, oh, this person is infected with COVID-19 because we can identify the some protein within this person's node. But nowadays we notice that with Omicron, many people, they have this kind of uh, uh, COVID-19 virus, but they don't show any symptoms. 
but some people may get very serious ill, and even some people died from that. Okay, but it's very important for us to predict why we computational intelligence is so important. Is that we can predict from what data we have. We have the uh, the 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 values we know their sequencing we know their number and we know the result whether people show symptoms or whether people will get sick so there are many different types of database to connect all the data in the world about uh, about nearly 40 uh, mainly 37 different databases to connect all the related protein data but we can find for the virus or for the protein to protein interaction data we identify the 11 database so here we can see some uh, 11 database we just mentioned. They include different types of virus or bacteria, right? Their data. And they show whether the a particular virus and bacteria, they cause problem. So this is what the proteomics uh, uh, proteo uh, try to solve. We want to use existing data to predict whether a particular protein will cause problem or not. This is very important because we know we have COVID-19, but we don't know what will happen next year. We probably will find some new virus, particularly uh, quite often we, we uh, read some news from uh, Africa. Uh, they quite often have some new virus. Uh, human never know that. So we only know some people died from that. Then the WHO become very nervous. But uh, if we got that, we can isolate those, then we can analyze what's within the virus, what amino acid within the virus. Then we can use our historical data to see for this particular new virus, whether which put, which human's organs will be attacked. Is it a lung? Is it a nose? Is it in our stomach or instead? Okay? Because they may cause different problems. Uh, people may die from different uh, uh, functionality uh, uh, inefficiency so it's a die from that so we can use this kind of data to analyze that so this is a, a diagram to show you how we connect the data then how we're using the machine learning or the algorithms to analyze the data so as i said i will not go to a lot of detail about this but this diagram just showing that we have many different databases. then we connect data we analyze the virus or bacteria's uh, features then we use different algorithm to analyze them. So what we so here is also one example here. So every virus or bacteria uh, on the upper part we can see uh, very complex words, but here actually a few things uh, uh, showing here. Actually, quite often uh, they will cause us uh, have the diarrhea uh, to uh, to uh, have some stomach or instant problems. And quite often they are quite common. Uh, in most cases, we just drink water or take some tablets. They will all uh, resolve without problem because they uh, exist in our food. Uh, and uh, in any time, sometimes we, we eat uh, unhealthy food, or uh, uh, undercooked food, probably they cause problem. But even for them, we can see in the bottom, we have human proteins. Uh, it's about 18,000, 18181 in the human body. We have so many different types of proteins. For the bacteria, bacteria, they are quite simple. They don't have so many different types of proteins. They have about 500 to uh, 1,800 here in the bottom, if you see that. And within this kind of human and bacteria proteins, actually, the interactive because not all the proteins, it's like some virus attack our lungs, some virus attacks our liver. So virus, they only have a few, like we can see here, the, the battery uh, on the uh, fifth column. They only have 60 or, or the biggest one is 1092. These proteins, they will affect human body's proteins. In this case, human body's proteins may be just nine or about 1,866 proteins. They interact with each other. They cause a problem. So here we can see taxonomy uh, ID uh, 632 uh, looks very complex. It has a lot of interaction and a lot of positive case. But actually, you don't need to worry about that. That's not actually very uh, serious uh, one. 
uh, this is a very common one. Uh, actually, it actually sometimes makes our food taste good. But it actually, why they taste good? Because they cause some problem. We feel something different, but they will not make people to die, okay? But anyway, so we can see here, we have different pairs, different number of proteins interact with different number of proteins between human and the bacteria. Then we have many different types on the right side, we can see what are the positive pairs. But here the problem is we can see that among all the pro proteins, only a small number of proteins, they really cause a problem. So that brings us a big challenge. Because for machine learning, we know that we should have enough data or balanced data. We need to have the both positive case, we have negative case. Then we can predict the, the, the uh, positive case. So in this case, we have some treatment how to deal with, how to fill the data and to make sure to improve the results for this computation algorithm. So I will not go detail about the machine learning algorithms. Uh, here a list is uh, machine, uh, algorithm, machine learning algorithms we actually uh, implemented uh, in our experiment. Uh, random forest supports vector machine, logistic regression, decision trees, live-based uh, model, and a GBM. Uh, I will not go detail about all of them, uh, but we also look at what different uh, encoding methods, uh, because uh, if we just use one to seven, as the earlier slide showed, it's very simple. Uh, we have many different ways to really reflect, uh, even though they are the coding or metrics, but we want to reflect really 3D uh, structure of the proteins and also what are the relationship between uh, all the uh, spatial features of the proteins because only you can find uh, more detailed information about the protein of the virus or the uh, bacteria. we can have better prediction. But if you have the more complex encoding, the algorithms will be slower because you need to process more information. So next few slides is just showing that how good it will be. So this is showing that with different algorithms, with different features, that means how we represent the virus and bacteria, we can get different results. So here we, as I said, we need to have a balance. Of course, you want to have good prediction result, but that means you have longer computation time because you need to handle uh, more data. So I, I will just quickly show you the, this slide. But when you look at this, you will see all this bar is very high. And this is going down. And this is going down even further, especially if you look at certain uh, features here. So that means for different virus, different bacteria, how these algorithms can predict their uh, accuracy about the interaction may be quite different. So for some virus, some bacteria, they are quite nasty. Uh, we don't understand uh, what exactly how they work. Uh, this is why COVID-19 is so difficult, even though we have a different vaccination, uh, but people, some people, they just worry about whether really the vaccination works. And we don't know what the future variants of the COVID. Uh, we can see we have different peak of the new variant. So here again, it's uh, another, a method to show a different uh, um, virus. We can, we can also see here. Uh, so each of on the x uh, axis is different uh, uh, species of virus and bacteria. So here we can see some results are very good. If it's high, that means prediction result good. But if it's very really low, this is quite similar uh, between them. But this one we can see. Uh, sorry. This one, in the right side, this kind of virus is very difficult to predict, okay? They probably have certain problems. So here we can see we have a lot of results. So what we are going to do here, what we, what we did in the past few years, we actually did a lot of uh, uh, research on this uh, because uh, we have so many different uh, virus and bacteria to analyze. And this will ask, uh, require us to do a lot of uh, computation. Okay, so before I wrap up this part, so I just want to wrap up why this is important. So I, as I mentioned that actually now we have technology on to take picture of the virus or bacteria. This is showing the right side in this slide. 
that we can use a coloring to identify different amino acid. And we can even identify which part. For this one, we can see a red part. For very complex structure of the virus, only the red part actually is dangerous. All other part probably they are benign. But if we use the uh, microscopy or using the uh, medical methods, it's very expensive to do a lot of experiment. But if we can use a computer to predict, we just use the computer to, to calculate how likely this algorithm uh, this virus or bacterium will cause problem, then we will save a lot of money for the medical doctors or for the uh, biologists to they to do this kind of wet lab experimentation. So this is the, the value why we say computational uh, intelligence is very useful in this kind of protein mix. Okay, so we still have a bit of time as I promised so I finish uh, one uh, one and a half uh, hour, we have 20 minutes. I think it's enough. We talk about third uh, topic is intelligence uh, transport system. As I said, mobility as a service. I think we actually already enjoyed that. Uh, it's not something new. Uh, we say seamless multimodal journey. So this is talking about when you leave your home to go to uni or go to work. Along your path, you probably use different transport methods. You walk, you probably use bicycle or e-scooter nowadays. Then maybe go to a subway station. Then you stop somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I, I saw some picture of KDU. Uh, it's very nice uh, seaside uh, town. I'm not sure whether you have subway, uh, but probably you will, the final uh, last stop probably the bus stop if you don't drive your car by yourself, okay? Uh, if you don't have bus, like in the late evening, the bus is less frequent. Uh, nowadays we have Uber or we have ride sharing. So all these kind of things, they, we say multimodal journey. But nowadays we still use different uh, transport card. We use different uh, type of uh, apps uh, to access each of them. But in the future, we say mobility as a service is whether we can integrate everything together, okay? Just using more, one mobile app, uh, we can organize our trip. Uh, in different country, probably there are different solutions. Uh, I think in Singapore or Australia, some cities, they already trial like one single app. Uh, this is difficult because uh, we have like a public transport, they are run by the government. But if you talk about Uber, they are run by the private company, but how you merge them together. Uh, for example, if you go to Google, uh, Google map to organize a trip, it will give you different options. Uh, it looks like, uh, uh, integrated, but they just give you suggestions how from uh, place one to place B, how you can travel. But they, if you really use that option, you still need to go to different apps uh, to organize a trip by yourself. Uh, but we say mobility as service is that we can integrate them together. So a few problems we want to solve in the transport area is one major thing is congestion. Especially when there are something disrupted, uh, like here is in Melbourne, uh, there's some uh, train delay, uh, people cannot go home. So this is uh, way uh, uh, before the uh, COVID. So, but uh, you don't see much this uh, now because uh, people work from home much more. And uh, uh, whether we miss a train, uh, this is about timeliness. So mobility as a service is what we, as I said, now we have so many different types of transport mode, but how we integrate them seamlessly. So this is one thing. So the big picture here is that we have so, again, we have so many data. So as far as I talked two topics uh, today, one education, one is uh, protein, uh, protein mix. We are all about data. We have different type of data on different things. But here with transportation, we of course have so many new data, but how we use the data? We have traditional, we, we have transported for thousands of years. Uh, in, the, in the past, we use the horses to transport. Now, later we have the cars. Now we have trains, we have the airplanes, we have Ubers. Uh, in the future, uh, probably people use more like e-scooters or self-driving cars, okay? Even drones uh, probably. But, but all these kind of data, 
we can use transport. But a lot of topics here is that how we predict the delay, how we predict the congestions. Okay? When we have data, if, if something already happened, we can't change it. But with the data, with the machine learning or computational intelligence, we can predict what will happen in the future. So we can collect long-term historical data to predict what will happen in the future. One very important data, a lot of people don't know that, but actually that was developed by Google, is called GTFS, General Transit Feed Specification. This is still widely used. Uh, think about a mobile phone. Uh, they tell you exactly time uh, when uh, Uber driver will come closer, or when a train really is stopping somewhere. We For the trains, we they run by the timetable. But you never know what will happen. They have real-time data to send through the GTFS. So that's why Google can always give you a very accurate uh, estimation of the trip. They can tell you exactly where each kind of transport uh, method uh, or the uh, tools is. So here is an example of the GTFS. So we have this kind of uh, uh, real-time data. This is based on GPS. For a particular car, particular train, particular plane, all transport modes, if they support a GTFS, a GTFS, they can report where I'm is. So this is very useful data for us to manage that, uh, to, to identify the uh, different transport modes uh, where they are. So here is an example we can see it looks like Excel file. So this is the, the data about Sydney train network. So we can see many train stations here, each line. Then for each train station, uh, how many trains are there and whether they are delayed or not. So we can see the column F is showing arrival delay. So of course here are some delay, uh, but we, we have zero, that means they are not delayed. And uh, we also have departure delay. We can see some uh, negative figures here. That means even when the departure, they departure, departed a bit early. Uh, that's because, uh, like in Australia, it's not like in Tokyo. Uh, in Sydney, it's not, not like Tokyo. We all know in Tokyo, all they should be very accurate up to uh, seconds. But in Australia, uh, our kind of train frequency is is uh, much longer. Uh, so it could be 15 minutes uh, uh, for one train to leave, not just uh, one minute. Okay, so that you leave early, if nobody is boarding, you definitely can leave early. You don't need to wait anybody. So they could be minors. Okay. So the first topic I talked today is about a train delay. So we can calculate the data. As I've said, we have GTFS. We can connect all the history data on a particular day in a, on a particular train station. Uh, how many trains go through there and how many minutes or how many seconds they actually delay. So this is a map of Sydney. I'm not sure whether anybody came to Sydney before or you watch, uh, notice this kind of map. So uh, it's nice harbor, harbor city, uh, but also the harbor city has a big problem is if you look at Sydney, where the Sydney uh, 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 name is spelled, there is uh, Sydney Harbour Bay. So Sydney has two parts. One is CBD is the south of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Then we have North Sydney. Both are populous places. So, but a lot of trains travel from north to south or south to north. They all go through Sydney Harbour Bridge. I'm not sure uh, anybody uh, watch TV every uh, New Year. Uh, we have fireworks. Uh, Sydney was one of the earliest city to have the fireworks to celebrate New Year. So they always have this on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. That's a very busy bridge because a lot of trains go through that. That also causes problem for Sydney transport. Because all these different lines, if you notice that we have some gray black lines here, all these lines, not all, but most of these lines, they will share the tracks on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Here you will notice some green dots or red dots. 
those are the train stations. The green means at that train station there's no delay. The red means at that train station there are delay. We can see closer to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, it's in the harbour, okay? More red dots. Because anything happens on one line, some train delayed, the later train will be delayed. And that other train lines will have the trains delayed. So this is a scenario in Sydney. With GTFS, because it's based on GPS technology, this is Sydney Central Station. So we can see here, it has maybe 20, uh, more than 20 uh, tracks. A lot of trains, because it's Sydney Central, most of trains will come to here. And we can see the right side, the, uh, uh, some uh, clustered train lines. Actually, they are going to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So we can see here, on the right side, we have more red dots. On the left side, actually, it's intercity. So they have longer, uh, they have longer uh, uh, intervals between the trains. So they don't worry too much about the delay. But on the right side, we said every 50 minutes have one train. But because the trains, they share the same line on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Actually, for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, actually every three to four minutes, they will have a train go through. If that train is delayed, then all the other trains will be delayed. So this is the way we, we, the scenario, as we said, we want to find out how we predict the delay. So here we use long short term memory. This is a deep learning method. As I said, I don't want to go deeper about the machine learning algorithm itself, but it's, uh, and also some equations. So this is basically, is, um, is a very, uh, widely used uh, neural network or machine learning methods nowadays for uh, a very typical deep learning methods to do a lot of different things. Uh, if you are really interested in the research, uh, if you're any student, you will read a lot of LSTM papers nowadays. So basically, it can use his historical data very well to reflect that from the historical data, how we have better prediction. But we always say deep learning is very smart. As far as you give them data, deep learning can learn something, can do some prediction. But in this case, we found that purely use deep learning is not enough. In this delay prediction problem, we also need to use experts knowledge. Expert, expert knowledge or expert system was a very old topic in the AI. Nowadays, AI is more about deep learning. As far as you have the data, you just ask the neural network, try to learn. In the past, actually, expert system is quite popular many years ago. Expert system is basically based on if else. It's based on deduction. If something happens, then something else happens. Or if something don't happen, something will happen, or something else will not happen. So the expert system is that we use human knowledge, we use expert knowledge. So this is human knowledge. This is not purely based on data. Of course, we have all this delayed data exactly in the time or minutes, minutes or seconds. But we also have some common sense. For the delays, quite often we want to avoid a crash. So we, this is showing that uh, uh, we have green, purple, red. The green means there's no delay, it's on, on time. We have purple, we have red, that means primary delay. Why we have purple? The purple always after the red. Because if we have a primary delay, some train delayed, then all the rest of train on that line will be delayed. And it will also affect other lines if we share the the, uh, the the train lines between the different uh, train tracks between the different lines. So here we can see that we can calculate the data for a particular train station, uh, how many delays they happen. Then we can find out what are the scenarios we have more secondary delay. 
Sometimes one train is delayed, no problem, as far as it can departure in time. Okay? Then the next train, they may be slight delayed. They will not crash because they leave certain snack time for people to catch up. Here we can see we have three lines, or three trains, A, B, C. They go uh, X, Y, Z. They go through three train stations. Here we can see normally it should be go through the dash line. Uh, A to B, B stop a while, then go to C. But here we can see in real scenario, B actually is when they stop in the B, probably somebody fell off the track. They need to wait. Okay? There are some delay. Because of the delay, Y need to delay. They need to delay, but because there's a snack time, uh, they, the delay for Z, the delay is not as much as a, as a X, no problem. But a big problem is if the train Y already arrived to B, but actually the X train hasn't left. In this case, in most cases, if the B hasn't left A, probably Y shouldn't start from A to B. Okay? It's all depend on how you schedule that because basically safety is very important. So that's why we say we have rules. Okay? We have human rules, how to manage the transport, how to manage the delays. So here is a scenario if we, if we have blue, green, it's all good. But if there's a primary delay, delay, we can see the whole network will have big delay, become all blue. So this is what exactly happened when we say congestion or, or big delay. So this is the work we can do uh, to predict uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, primary delays. So we have the work to do that. Okay, so let me give a summary what we have done uh, in the past few years. Uh, first, we, uh, we have the micro learning as a service. So we actually we uh, collaborate with quite a few uni uh, in uh, United States, in uh, China, and in Australia. For the protein uh, knowledge as a service, we collaborated with Monash because uh, I didn't mention that, uh, but uh, because this is a very big topic. Uh, if anybody know Alpha Fold, uh, we, uh, I'm not sure whether you read the news, Alpha Fold, uh, this is a very big project in the world. Uh, they try to predict the, all the protein structures. So if our work uh, collaborates with our fold, uh, we basically is just looking at the protein-protein interaction. Alpha fold is doing something else. They just look at each protein, what they will look like. Okay? If we have all this knowledge, actually we can design new vaccination. We can design new antiviral or antibacterial medicine. So this is why we work with Monash. They have very strong uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, department. Then we worked with Sydney Train. So why we show the Sydney Train network. So we are doing the uh, MAS with them. So this is all I uh, can share with uh, everybody. Hope you are not like uh, 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 feeling very boring after already one and a half an hour. As, as I said, most people <laughs> uh, be focused uh, in 15 minutes, uh, but I welcome any question, uh, any question or any parts, I'm happy to answer and we can discuss. Uh, and uh, even if you just want to talk about something else, like uh, uh, because I, I'm a adjunct professor at uh, KDU, uh, if you say we want to do some collaboration, what you are doing, uh, and uh, uh, how uh, how we like maybe uh, co-author some papers or co-write some grant application or even embed something in our teaching program. I'm all happy to to discuss. We still have some time. Thank you, Prof Shen. I think that was uh, very insightful. There's a lot of information. Uh, I would, would like to open up the floor for questions now. If you have, you can. Uh, unmute your microphone or you can type it in the chat box for prof any question anyone have any questions or would like to ask anything
looks like there aren't any questions. Prof, I think there are no, no one's asking any questions. So I think for now, there are no questions. Anything, I'm sure they will be able to send an email or reach out to you uh, yes. via the contact information, right? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah that's great. Okay, I think uh, if there's no questions, I think we will conclude our session today. Um, thank you very much, Prof Chen, for sharing your the, the knowledge with us. And I think uh, there's a lot of things to, for us to um, digest, I suppose. Yeah, and then I think we are very far from understanding some of the things we thought we know and learning from your good self. So uh, I think before we go, um, can I request that the, our participants with cameras to switch on the camera? Let's take a group photo and then um, for commemorative purposes, right? And then we can we'll conclude today's session. Can you uh, please switch on your cameras if possible? Just to take a look at all our participants with us today. It's a lot of people. Okay, I think that's all the people we have on camera. Okay, just look at the camera. We'll just do that in the next three seconds. In three, two, one. Okay, thank you very much. So um, with that, thank you everyone. Thank you to all the participants, students, lecturers, colleagues from all our campuses. Thank you, Professor, for sharing with us again. Very insightful. We will reach out to you again, and thanks for connecting with us. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Stay safe. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.